Well, I'm basically I'm here to to tell you something about this book I wrote actually four years ago together with Massimiliano Guareschi, who was an attempt to, uh, at that time at least, uh, it was we started to work on the, the use and the abuse of the category of exception in uh, international politics. And we were involved in this European network uh, research together with Claudia Radau, Rob Wolk, and all the guys, the philosopher. And we realized that exceptional, uh, the, the category of exception became a kind of plus part two in order to explain everything. So how to, it, it was a moment in time that was deeply influenced by the war on terror, by Guantanamo, by the military order, the Patriot Act, uh, and uh, and, but, and so these kind of keywords, exceptional reason, exceptional politics, became a way to explain everything and from the war on terror up to the more discrete dimension as the, uh, for instance, the abuse of the, uh, uh, the primacy of the executive over the parliament in the evolution of contemporary liberal democracies as well as uh, in the recourse of the executive de decree, emergency decree, within the parliamentary and uh, the political life of each, each country, each national state. So, and everything we were referred and reduced to the category of exception. And we were in a, little, a little bit suspicious about this abuse of the category of exception. To this, uh, trend to this tendency, for sure, George Agamben contributed directly with his book, his text of uh, 2007, I guess, State of Exception, but it was already the, the how can I say, the, uh, the climate of uh, this revival of, of the exceptional category, and few formulas, like the eight theses of Walter Benjamin uh, concerning the tradition of oppressor that teach us that the, the state of exception became, you know, has become the, the norm, as well as Carl Schmitt mantra, the sovereign is the one who decided uh, on, a, on the state of exception, became this kind of formula that automatically were adopted, employed to explain what was going on in terms of the evolution or involution of politics both at national and international level. That was, so we reacted against this, basically. We had this kind of suspicious mind against the abuse of the category of exception. The subtitle of the book is, okay, I'm a sociologist, so I'm not a philosopher, I'm involved in this uh, peripheral ontology, it's not the central one, but the subtitle is as a Kantian eco in a way, is a critic of exceptionalist reason, which uh, there is nothing of Kantian within the book, of course, uh, and we are rather deeply empiricist, uh, so we, we have not this kind of attitude to a theoretical speculation. But if there is a Kantian echo, it consists in the, the fact of taking seriously the condition of possibility for ex exceptional reason. That means considering the time present time and pre present temporalities and present spatialities, political spatialities, are something that doesn't really match with the, uh, the very idea of exception. And I will explain. But I want to show you this, this fragment of The Wizard of Oz, because I, was, I have a daughter that now she's 17, and she studied Greek literature at the, at the high school. So she was studying the Greek tragedy, and and we were together, and, and so for me it was a chance even to restudy something that I used to study 30 years ago. Um, and she was concerned by the difference of the role played by the Deus Ex Machina. You know, how to do Deus Ex Machina, you know. <laughs> okay. The Deus Ex Machina in Aeschylus and Sophocles tragedy and in Euripides tragedy. There is a shift. And this shift can be synthesized in the meaning of X, which means at the same time from and by. It could, mean, it could apply even for from and by. So we can say that in Sophocles, and in, uh, in Aeschylo for sure, and even in Sophocles, the role of the Deus Ex Machina is something that comes from a machine, appear on the stage, and find a solution. His appearance is a revelation that finds a solution. While in Euripides' tragedy, 
uh, this dimension is totally revealed as, as fake. There is no solution in Euripides' tragedy. And so even the deus ex machina, the god or the sovereign, if you want, is totally unaffected. He has no power of, over, the, the, over the events. He has no power to change a situation. So and in a way, the deus ex machina in Euripides means that the deus is produced by the machine. But it's a ghost, it's an hologram, it's a kind of optical effect. So that's why I was considering, yes, the, the, no, traveling on, on the plane, I'd say, oh, there is the wizard of Oz. And, and so I, I, I asked Bianca if I was finished, because I well remember, because the last time I, I watched the movie was about to, more than 10 years ago, together with, with, with my daughter. And, and no, I was not pretty sure about this fragment, but I found it. And Bianca, my daughter, uh, helped me in finding this is the scene. It is when Dorothy and uh, her three friends arrived and are facing the wizard. Yeah, yeah, I, I enlarged the image. And, okay, Bianca. At that time, when she was uh, seven, she was really scared about the, the witch, and I was most, more scared about the about Dorothy. I think this is the most terrifying figure in the, the socks and the shoes of Dorothy are shocking me. But, <laughs> but this is interesting. Look at here. So, what happens? There is a, this terrifying and scaring image, ghost in a way. So everybody is totally frightened and scared. But then they discovered that beneath, behind the curtain, there is the, this machinery, this machine that produced the hologram of. So, you remember, it's, it's really nice. And he, he keep on doing this. Uh... <laughs> okay, that's it, that's enough. So why I show you this one? Because in a way, uh, our critique to assumption was basically based upon the assumption that exception worked as a reduction of complexity. A reduction of complexity, and in a tautological way. Because the state of exception, either in both as a political tools, a political dis apparatus, a dispositive, it works to reduce the complexity, the hindrances of the legal order by suspending it through an act of decision. So it's a moment, an act, a singular act. It's an event, if you want, that suspending partially or totally and temporarily or permanently the legal order reduce the complexity of the legal order. Now powerfully reduce the complexity. And so in, intrinsically is a it's a, a tool in order to reduce the complexity. But even the conceptual use, the, the analytic at the, an, uh, an analytical level, the use of the category of exception sometimes runs the risk to reduce the complexity of contemporary geography and contemporary multiple temporalities, to reducing it to a singular act or event, to a, a dimension which is singular. So we, were, we started from this assumption. This was basically our assumption when we decided to, in a way, criticize and write something against this abuse of the category of, of exception. But at the same time, we recognized that exception was a powerful and explicative tool, very powerful. So it was an insidious game to try to deconstruct <laughs> The, the, the assumption of the exceptional reason, if you want to quote a Kantian ego, uh, while, while recognizing its powerful effectiveness in explaining, and actually because symptoms of what we refer to as exception, we can really find, find symptoms in, in, in contemporary politics. So there was this kind of ambivalent attitude towards the category and the use. But, and so the idea is, we, we started with a gun then, and we detected what we consider a kind of, a kind of, how can I explain it, a kind of inherent bias to quote what is the, the book of Thomas Pinch, a, a theological bias in, in the 
use a gamble made, which means, in, in our opinion, a kind of monotheist attitude toward this, an act of belief, an act of uh, faith, into this singular uh, idea of the event, which is very strong tendency in contemporary politics. And I, I, I think it's a very important tendency. I think, for instance, to Alain Badiou, to other, no, you know. Uh, but in a way, this, in a way, suggests a representation of the present in terms of an inflation of events and a strike of processes. And we try to reverse this representation by suggesting that contemporary politics is more defined by a lack of decision, a lack of event, and which is filled up with constituent processes that are materializing before our very eyes. But the category of exception sometimes renders is to mask this productive dimension. Now, this is particularly evident, in my opinion, in what concerns the crisis management. Consider, for instance, all the debate about the possibility of the Brexit, the exit of the, the Greek default. Nobody takes a decision. Nobody, until now, has taken a, a clear decision. But it's six, seven years that in this in-between time, without a decision, with a lack of decision, the material constitution, the material condition of Greece, of Greece as well as in Italy, in the south of Europe, dramatically changed. And those are the constituent processes that without a direct event in terms of sovereign act of decision that exclude Greece from European Union are no uh, are happening before our very So we were detecting this kind of constitu constituent processes instead of focusing on the sovereign moment of, of the event, if you want, of the sovereign decision. And in a way, so we we found in, in Agamben and in other authors more than him, because it's, by the way, again, it's a very uh, complicated and terrific philosopher, so it's not so easy to criticize him, particularly in Italy, where it's a kind of hegemonical uh, dimension that there are a lot, but everywhere in the world. No, the Agambenian, <laughs> we all are Agambenian in a way, so. Uh, so it was a kind of risky task, and it was a total fiasco. The end. How do you say fiasco? Um, failure, because nobody received our messages. But okay, in a way, Tony Negri, and other other friends and guys supported us in this attempt. But the the main target was failure. Really. But it is not important. And so we tried to develop the, a kind of polytheistic attitude against this monotheist. Uh, vision of the uh, of the exception as a singular act of suspension of the legal order, and in a way we play the idea of excess of something that exceeds rather than suspend. So our basic uh, mo movement was to oppose to the to the idea of something that uh, often a singular act of suspension of the legal order a proliferation, uh, a superfetation, an inflation of processes that exceed and re redefine the, the spatiality, the territorialities, and even the temporalities of what we can call the legal order <laughs> or uh, the jurisdiction, okay? By using category from uh, Teubner, the idea of mixed regime, partial regime, they, uh, by using category basically on the critical geography. So we are more attracted by the, the cartography drawn by Saskia Sassen, by Neil Brenner, the idea of multiscalarity, the idea of rescaling, in order to, to give back the complexity of the contemporary political geography, which cannot be reduced to a single scalar or a single dimension, univocal dimension, as the very notion of exception seems to rely upon. Okay. So, and we try to find these symptoms of a polytheist approach in the two main authors that are, we normally refer to when, when we think about exceptions, so in Carl Schmitt and in Walter Benjamin. So we didn't avoid to, to match and to confront with, with Carl Schmitt and Walter Benjamin. But instead of focusing on the political theology, uh, we prefer the nomos of the earth. 
in which there was a geography, I think the Namas of the Art is definitely a geographical book. It's a book of geography, you know? Um, and the complexity of the geography suggested by the Namas of the Art was useful to redefine and criticize this uh, single scalar geography implied in the very use of the notion of exception. And the same is, for instance, for Walter Benjamin, because if you Leaving aside the, 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 the thesis of, on, uh, on the eight thesis on, on the philosophy of history, which has a powerful cent centrifugal effort in, in the very notion of the tradition of the oppressor. What does it mean, the tradition of the oppressor? You can find traits within the notion of the oppressed of something that has been redeclined by post-colonial criticism in the term of subaltern of, or the governed, as Parta Chatterjee suggested in a very important book, The Politics of the Government. So it was a, a kind of displacing this tendency to concentrate and to focusing on, on, on a geography that was defined in terms of borders and, and scalar notions. And so we found, even in the thesis of Benjamin, Benjamin something that problematized this uh, univocal geography that the category of exception refers to. But most notably, we use the Trauerspiel, which is the, the origin of the Baroque drama, Benjamin books, where, which is characterized uh, it's a kind of heavy to read as a, as a book, but if we can say something on, on that book is that what Benjamin uh, suggests is a dimension which characterizes the German Baroque drama uh, uh, within which the sovereign is characterized by a kind of paralysis, lack of decision, and is overdetermined by the plot, the intrigue, the subject, the character in the Baroque drama doesn't express a, a, a will, a capacity of, to decide and is completely dominated by the events, by the processes, by the plot. So there was this kind of parallax uh, effect that brings the Baroque very close to the present, to contemporary geography. We, we discover, in a way, this kind of actuality and, uh, of, of the, the Benjamin as a time that is characterized by the fold, as <coughs> you suggested, no? the Baroque is that one. And the Baroque geography of the present was something similar in a way from, from the landscape uh, uh, characterizing the Baroque drama in Benjamin reading. Okay. Mm. All these are, were played a kind of role of, of ingredients for our critique. Our critique. But our critique basically what was based upon the category of space and time. Uh, suggested by the what we refer to as the exceptional reason. Do you understand, or I'm totally? No, no. Is does it make sense? Thank okay. you. Um, uh, no, I don't know whether does it, but at least my my English is enough understanding. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, but as a one. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. Um, so, from the one side, we are. Uh, in terms of a almost uh, uh, conventional Kantian critique of the exceptional reason, we, we took seriously time and space, the two a priori. And what happened with the space? So, from the one side, we are trying to confront the implicit geography the category of exception suggests to the multiscalar geography of, uh, of uh, uh, global processes and flows. No? and the way in which flows touch the earth and change the territories. So, uh, as I already said, very useful was categories such as multiscalarity. Multiscalarity, you know what Saskia Sassen suggests as multiscalarity, is the, the double dimension according to, double process according to which each territory is invested by uh, a plot uh, of processes of, differ, of different scalar processes. And at the same time, uh, so any, any, any single territory must be divided and uh, um, dispackaged in a way, political term, by the insistence of different scalar processes, processes that belongs to a single and, and different uh, scalar unity. 
but um, there is also an even more dynamic effort to conceptualize this geography when, for instance, the one suggested by Neil Brenner in, in the idea of rescaling, which means that it is no longer possible to isolate something and reduce it to a scalar dimension. So, even the, the, the abstract notion of scale, which is a basic tool for geographer, revealed to be useless if you want to understand contemporary politics, a contemporary dynamics, process of capital accumulation, valorization, in which everything is mixed up. So, uh, there is another notion which I guess it's really has been quite important for us, which is the idea of friction, suggested by this ethnographer of, uh, of US, in Duke, Anna, Anna Lowenhaus, uh, Singh, exactly. Um, that means the friction among scalar, different scalar processes, and um, as well as among scalable and non-scalable entities and processes. So, and it was another way of problematizing this uh, bidimensional cartography, which is a conventional cartography, that, in our opinion, the exceptional reason relies upon. I always repeat the same story as a man. And there, there was also a double process uh, that even Saskia Sassen or Friedman or the critical geographer suggest, which I think synthesized this exceeding movement that red redefine the political cartography and a double process according to which uh, um, some that concern directly the very notion of sovereignty because we are we we are confronted with processes that, uh, according to which some crucial aspect of sovereignty tends to assume a non-territorial nature today while at the same time any single ter national territory is, uh, so to say, internally multiplied, that is, unpackaged from a juridical perspective by a plurality of legal orders. And Sassen synthesized all this in the idea of the territory that deboarding territoriality. So this is the meaning of exceeding, in a way. This is what we, we, we mean by playing the idea of excess against the idea of suspension or exception. And, but the, the most problematic category was time. Because time, to, to talk about time today meant to confront with the different, several different temporality involved by capital, extractive capital logic of uh, accumulation and valorization. So, and this was basically founded on the work of Anna Singh or Iva Hong, the ethnography of Far East economy, the logistic, how logistic redefined, how many temporalities are involved in the process of capital accumulation today. And which are the effect it this multiple temporality and processes de determine upon the 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 state uh, space time we can say. Okay. So it was definitely not done. Um, and plus there was the, the final mm, tool that we found in our critique was based upon uh, a, a, a specific sequence, the notion and the, the, the exceptional reason suggest. Which means if exception is something to which a sovereign subject reveals its, uh, itself through an act of suspension, it means that the subject is, is in a way pre-assumed to this act and to the consequence. So there is a kind of mutual crossover from the Uganda, no? It's, a, it's a, an act of, in Heideggerian time, we can say the Amphenborgen, of revelation, it's a kind of a let's say, it's, no? The, the sovereign, like the hologram we have seen, manifests himself <coughs> through this act of decision, according to the theological reading of of Kajnit, of the, category, the conventional reading of exception, with, which Gamben nonetheless compli complicated a little bit. But, uh, uh, and so we found in, in the course Foucault gave at the Collège de France uh, of 77 78, uh, population, and through the notion of governmentality, and through a, a specific category Foucault used, that is the antecedent of the God, antecedent, antecedent, how do you say it? That comes with the antecedent of the government. Because the, the real effort of Foucault in that course was to relativize 
the dimension of the state to show how the state was a fragile conjunctural effect, effect of governmental practices, of government uh, practices of government, okay, technology, technique of government. And so what does it mean this? It means that in this kind of genealogy, the effect come, comes first, because before the cause. So it's a, it's a kind of reversion. And in this idea of the ante antecedent, antecedent of the government, we found the most powerful critique to the exceptionalism, in a way. Because it means we translated it into a kind of reversal. Because the project of Go was linked. I, I found the, the page of the quotation of the Go, the exact quotation. To go stated in, 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 in one lecture. After all, maybe the state is only a composite reality and a mythicized abstraction whose importance is much less than we think. The state is a fragile effect of government practices and processes. So, the antecedent of the govern, in a way, according to Foucault, uh, involved the need to look for a point outside of the state. No? go repeat several times. I'm looking to a point, and eventually it didn't accomplish because he gave back a story that is a genealogy of the state as a product of government practices, but that is at the same time a story in the state, within the state. Even if his effort to look outside, without the state, no? His statement is it's relentless effort to look for uh, uh, and to look for a, a point outside you now and I found the uh, is it possible to move outside the state is it possible to place the modern state in a general technology of power that the sure mutation development uh, and so on and functioning and before he said the primacy of role over all other types of power and sovereignty before all, uh, of the type of power that we can call government and which has led to the development of a series of specific governmental apparatus. But the effort to look outside of the state nowadays is, is more and more urgent. So in that conjunctural mo moment, Foucault arrested this, and then we, we know the trajectory that Foucault for now, the, the, course, the following course was about the Nascence of New Politique, which is the only excursion in contemporary politics of Foucault David, you know better than me. But then there was this, in a way, uh, turn over the hermeneutics of the self, and, and, and all that. So, it stopped, it was a kind of tree show that he, he never passed it through, to look outside of the state. And what does it mean to go outside of the, of the modern sovereign state machine in the global in the global amidst the global processes today? And which is the pl the place and and the possi very possibility of a notion of sovereignty as the one that is based upon the, the state scale? That was the predicament that uh, uh, originally we detected in an exceptional logic. So finally. Look at so we agree with different. Uh, do you know the book of uh, uh, Iva Ong, uh, Neoliberalism as an Exception? No, and she she talks about this mixed sovereign governmental machine, and we agree. But and we agree even together with there is another terrific book of a friend, very close friend of ours, of me, Sandra Mezzal and Brett Nielsen, Borders as Method. Did you read it? Do you know this book? in which they both speak about this mixed sovereign governmental machine. We accept this idea, but at the condition of reversing the relation, and to conceive it in terms of a governmental machine that produced sovereign, scattered sovereign effect. This was the basic idea we had. We have to no, conceive this horizontal machine that is not it doesn't work like uh, the vertical idea, exception, and centripetal and uh, univocal idea the re exceptional reason refers to. And we have to conceive this horizontal, <coughs> centrifugal, and mixed machine 
that produce scattered sovereign effects. What does it mean produce scattered sovereign effects? In a way, it's the same, but now it's too complicated to talk about geography, because I, I, I remember a quotation of Frederick Ratzel, the geographer, the, the German geographer, who say, nowadays border is no longer a line, but it's a zone. What does it mean, a zone? It means Grand Sound, you use the word Grand Sound. You say, uh, the, the conventional way of thinking about borders is a, a kind of is in terms of a line separated an inside and an outside, you know, an area of inclusion and exclusion, and it is a sovereign dimension of the border, conventional social uh, sovereign. But at, at the same time, Ratzel suggested in 1910, so uh, an idea of border as a zone, which is no longer well distinguished in terms of inclusion and exclusion, but is filled up with scattered mani manifestation of border. No? Scattered manifestation of war. And the same it works for sovereignty today, we guess. Once this mixed machine produces scattered effect of, sovereign, of sovereignty, which can, we can find in, in the International Monetary Fund, we can find in the European Bank, we can find in different actors that are both private, institutional, uh, national, inter subnational. So this is the, the complex geography of the present in a way. And uh, at this level, we guess. The antecedent of the government means today to look for the scattered manifestation of sovereignty produced by this mixed machine, like the, the machine who produced the hologram of in, in the Wizard of Oz. No, the, the, the optical, uh, how do you say, the optical effect of, uh, of a god, of a deus ex machina, of, uh, of a sovereign. Two final points. Do we have still? Yeah, and then I finish. Two final points that are important to update our report because we wrote it in 2011 and we were really tired and, and annoying by the book, so they did, we didn't want to talk too much. Because it <laughs> and, but now I think that this, it is worth the case to work on in this idea of uh, reversing the antecedent of the government for what concern the, 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 the current crisis management. Because, of course, it should be very easy to say that crisis is an exceptional category. An exceptional reading of the crisis should be very easy. And I'm surprised that Gambin didn't use it. Because it's smart, then <laughs> they have to do it. And because I think that this way of representing the crisis is like, in Italy we say, you look at the tree and you lose the bush. So what is what means we are paralyzed by the sublime dimension of the crisis, and we do not we lose the frame, the picture, which means that what really matters is the government of the crisis, the way in which the crisis is governed, the constituent processes that are materializing before our very eyes under the mask of the crisis, the sublime mask of the crisis. No. Exception is a very <coughs> aesthetic category, you know? as Burke suggested. Now you are paralyzed by exception, and in terms of state of necessity, but the necessity doesn't accomplish, doesn't accomplish a decision sometimes. So when you are paralyzed, you don't take any kind of decision. You are, in a way, over, over determined by the necessity. Um, this is another story, by the way. Mm. So what does it mean, this? That, once again, Instead of conceiving the present in terms of uh, an inflation of events and a, and a strike of processes, we were looking for the constituent processes that are producing sovereign effect. Producing sovereign effect. That was our mantra. And so, and, and the second point is so, and this is, it could be useful to apply for a critic of the crisis management of constituent processes. What does it mean balance of budget? What does it mean the fiscal compact? What does it mean all this? Of course, there are decisions, but there are decisions that are taken at different level and are not reducible to a single moment of decision, a sovereign act. It's more important to look for the consequence that these uh, practices, these multiple level practices, determine and uh, impose on, on our material condition of life. The second, and the second point was something related to, 
if you consider the, the, the situation now in the Mediterranean Sea, that transforming the Mediterranean is the, in the hugest graveyard and cemetery of, of, of the world, maybe, no, not of the world, because there are other sites in the world in which people die, maybe more than in the Mediterranean, but the Mediterranean is now the, the several shipwrecking of migrants and asylum seekers in the Mediterranean. What does it mean that, that this kind of death? A Chile and Bembe should talk about necropolitics, no? To a kind of politics of death, which is a kind of definitely a, a sovereign prerogative, Vita and Cisco protestas. But I think there is no there is no decision in, in those death. There is no decision. There is a lack of decision that produced that. So it means that governance and the govern governmental machine that Europe is adopting is a killing machine uh, as much as it used to be the sovereign killing machine that we knew. But it kills in different way, without a decision. And in a way, it gives back an idea of what we, uh, what, what our critique of the exceptional reason was based upon. This death without a decision, the mass killing without an act of, of, of that's it okay okay thank you